just begin by giving a sense of why I'm so interested in this question of what gaslighting is. Um, a couple of reasons are the intrinsic interest of the phenomenon. So gaslighting, I take it, is an inherently rather puzzling phenomenon where very roughly speaking, agents have pre prevailed upon not to believe the evidence of their senses or their own memories, their own experiences by epistemically dominant agents. And it's puzzling how that can occur. So that's one reason I, I'm interested in the topic. Another reason is that as Professor Green mentioned in his uh, wonderful introduction that I'm so uh, grateful for, I've been interested in the subject of misogyny for about the last, uh, I suppose now, seven years. Um, and I think gaslighting works to conceal and perpetuate a great deal of misogyny in ways that I hope will come out during this talk. Interestingly, as well as that, we'll also see ways in which misogyny can be a tool of gaslighting. Um, and the final reason is that gaslighting is a word that is being used much more frequently in recent years. So it was actually 2018, uh, in 2018, it was the OED's buzzword of the year. So my feeling is that when a word proliferates in culture, that's often an opportunity for philosophers in particular and humanists in general to look at the phenomenon referred to by the term and try to work out what it is and why it matters and why it might matter at this particular cultural moment. Um, so that's enough by way of preamble. Okay, so I'll start with some uh, extant definitions of gaslighting, um, which I will seek to problematize as the talk continues. So I'll begin with the psychiatrist Neil Klein's definition, and this is from a, an autobiographical piece of his in 2006. He defines gaslighting as the effort of one person to undermine another person's confidence and stability by causing the victim to doubt their own senses and beliefs. Okay, so far so standard. Similarly, uh, the good old OED, I have to include a dictionary definition for the sake of posterity, says that gaslighting is the action or process of manipulating a person by psychological means into questioning his or her own sanity. Again, another similar definition is offered by the philosopher uh, Veronica Ivey, who was then writing as Rachel McKinnon, she writes that when a hearer tells a speaker that the speaker's claim isn't that serious or they're overreacting or they're being too sensitive or they're not interpreting events properly, then that constitutes gaslighting. And finally, the psychologist Paige L. Sweet, whose empirical work on gaslighting I'll draw on later in this talk, defines gaslighting as a type of psychological abuse aimed at making victims seem or feel crazy uh, creating a surreal interpersonal environment, which as a substantive matter of fact, often relies on the association of femininity with irrationality. So I take it these definitions all have something important in common, which is that they assume that gaslighting works by undermining a victim's rational capacities or making her question her own sanity or rationality more broadly. And I'm going to be arguing that in point of fact, gaslighting can also work by making someone question her moral rectitude or her, the goodness of her own character. And that this is actually a prevalent and important form of gaslighting that makes gaslighting a more everyday phenomenon that we may have hitherto appreciated. Um, but before I get there, um, I also want to pause over the philosopher Kate Abramson's characterization of gaslighting in her very insightful and important 2014 piece, Turning Up the Lights on Gaslighting. So I should say that Abramson's project, like the previous authors, is different than mine. None of these authors are particularly focused on defining and characterizing gaslighting. They're focused on other features of it, um, but they nevertheless have to take a stand on what gaslighting is in the course of, um, in Abramson's case, having an account of the moral wrongness of gaslighting. So her project of accounting for what's morally so wrongful about gaslighting and so harmful about this practice sees her taking a stand on exactly what 
gaslighting is um, that I want to uh, question and what follows. So she says that very roughly the phenomenon that's come to be picked out with that term gaslighting is a form of emotional manipulation in which the victim tries consciously or not to induce in someone the sense that her reactions, perceptions, and, uh, and or beliefs, um, as well as memories are not just mistaken, but utterly without grounds, paradigmatically so unfounded as to qualify as crazy. And I should uh, add an addendum that the word crazy is, of course, a deeply ableist term. Um, when it's being used in this literature, it's being used uh, in scare quotes to indicate that this is the ableist perception that the gaslighter is trying to take advantage of in making his victim feel quote unquote crazy. Uh, this isn't to endorse that label for um, the properties that he attempts to portray his victim as having or that he holds um, his victim does in fact have. So um, because of Abramson's uh, view about what gaslighting is, she goes on to hold that um, when she gives her account of the wrong of gaslighting, she writes that the gaslighter's characteristic desire, desire is to destroy the possibility of disagreement where the only sure path to that is destroying the source of the possible disagreement, the independent, separate, deliberative perspective from which disagreement might arise. And gaslighters for Abramson both characteristically believe that their targets are crazy and also behave in ways that aim to make them crazy, to destroy their independent perspective as a rational agent. Now, Abramson is sensitive to the criticism that this characterization of gaslighting might be held to be, quote, too sharp by half, end quote. And she's sensitive to the criticism, but in my view, doesn't fully answer it satisfactorily. I'm going to be holding in effect that Abramson is really onto something about the gaslighter's aim, but that there are many roads to Rome here and that there are much subtler and more everyday ways to try to squash someone's independent perspective other than by destroying their rationality entirely. I'm going to be arguing that Abramson's characterization of gaslighting is not broad enough to capture many of the phenomena that I'm about to go on to um, try to elucidate. Okay, so um, for me, gaslighting is a more everyday phenomenon, but that being said, I'm actually going to use quite stark and extreme examples of gaslighting initially, because what I think these examples do is allow us to distinguish the structure of gaslighting uh, more easily, which we can then see actually applies to more everyday cases. So um, this is why I pick these quite stark examples for the purposes of initial elucidation, not because I think all gaslighting is like this, but because I think it makes the nature of gaslighting um, particularly clear. Um, okay, so I'm going to be looking at three types of examples of gaslighting and what follows. I'll look at the original case of gaslighting, which is how the term came into being. It's a somewhat complicated story, actually, so you'll have to uh, indulge me as I go through the example and what the metaphor actually means, um, but we will get to that. Then I'm going to be distinguishing a phenomenon I've hinted at already, which I call moral gaslighting. And this is where someone uses the prospect of depicting someone as morally bad in order to manipulate her beliefs rather than the prospect of her being written off as irrational or insane or crazy in order to manipulate her beliefs. So this prospect of making someone out to be morally bad in some way is, I hold, a powerful technique of gaslighting, one that interacts with a lot of misogynistic social practices and mores. Um, and to make that argument, I'm going to be using a real life case study, uh, Dirty John, the podcast uh, that was subsequently made into a hit TV series. Um, and I'll also look at the sociological research that I mentioned um, from Paige Sweet, uh, so sociological slash psychological, uh, where Sweet is interested in cases um, among others where someone is depicted as a crazy bitch with the emphasis on the latter gendered epithet. 
Uh, so those are some of the cases I'll consider, as well as the third type of example I'll be looking at are collective examples of gaslighting. So one such case is where we have a political agent, um, such as, say, the president of the United States, such as a Donald Trump, who gaslights in particular his supporters into buying wildly implausible narratives um, and political lines about what is going on that are manifestly false. Um, I'll also look at the phenomenon of cultural gaslighting uh, illuminated by the philosopher Elena Ruiz, where you have not even an agent involved, rather one collective um, group gaslighting another group. So for example, white folks gaslighting um, Indigenous and Black Americans uh, in her example. And similarly, I'll look at the phenomenon of racial gaslighting, another collective phenomenon that is in some ways similar to the phenomenon of cultural gaslighting, um, but hints at uh, some of the uh, features that I will use in my subsequent definition of gaslighting that uh, I hope to uh, put forward and uh, this is very much a work in progress, but a working definition of gaslighting is what I will leave you with. Okay, so let's start with this original example of gaslighting. Um, and yeah, uh, I hope you'll uh, not mind bearing with me as I go through the relevant details of the case. So the term gaslighting takes its name from the 1938 Patrick Hamilton play, Angel Street, which was performed on stage as Gaslight. The play was subsequently made into two films by the latter name, both a UK and an American version, which have become better known than the original play. But the play is to my mind richer than either film, and so it is going to form the basis for the discussion here. So in Gaslight, as I'll refer to it, Mr. Manningham appears to be intent on sending his wife Bella insane. His original motives for doing so only become apparent during the play's second act, but importantly, his behavior is intelligible right from the beginning, blending the play its claustrophobic, indeed suffocating atmosphere. Act one is a vivid depiction of domestic terror. Mr. Manningham wrongfoots and undermines his wife at every turn, humiliating her in front of their servant, correcting her constantly, and even impugning the anxiety he is thereby instilling in her as irrational and baseless. There's a, a little exchange at the beginning of Act One that brings this out, where Mr. Manningham asks, why are you so apprehensive, Bella? I was not about to approach you. And she responds nervously, no, dear, I know you weren't. Um, but he goes on to uh, uh, reproach her, indeed berate her shortly thereafter. So we see that this is in a way gaslighting upon gaslighting. She's not even allowed to identify the ways in which her independent, her independent perspective is suppressed within their marriage. Um, she's in a way obligated to um, make out that everything is fine between them interpersonally. So um, in a particularly cruel and long running series of manipulations, Mr. Manningham has led his wife Bella to believe that she is going out of her mind and losing possession of her rational faculties by regularly hiding their possessions uh, around their home and then holding her responsible for their disappearance. Um, and he holds her responsible not merely causally, but also morally. He depicts her as mischievous and wicked, as well as confused and delusional. He also accuses her most painfully and for my purposes, most interestingly of all, of deliberately hurting their pet dog, thus painting her as the cruel and abusive one, claiming that she just doesn't remember having done this cruel and malicious thing. And Bella really loves this dog, so it's a particularly painful accusation. Now, the combination of accusations is of course incoherent as Bella Manningham tries repeatedly to point out to her husband. If she really is confused and delusional and cannot help her behavior, then surely he ought to treat her kindly and try to help her rather than getting angry. But Mr. Manningham ignores this as he does with all of his wife's attempts to prevail upon his goodwill. 
She's truly powerless within their household. And she is a nobody outside of it since her husband has deliberately isolated her from all of her friends and relatives. She has no choice but to defer to him, and even then it does little to appease his seething temper. So the effect of Mr. Manningham's behaviour, which is a devastating portrait of a recognisable pattern of abuse, which subsequently came to be known as gaslighting for reasons I'll explain in a moment, the effect is to deprive Bella Manningham of the wherewithal to state even the most basic realities, despite her knowing them deep down to be the case. Toward the end of Act One, in an arguably disappointing uh, deus ex machina, a detective comes to visit Bella and tells her the terrible, albeit liberating truth. Her husband is in fact the diabolical Sidney Power, who murdered the former resident of their house, Alice Barlow, in order to steal uh, Barlow's rubies. And Power slit Alice Barlow's throat in order to silence her some 15 years prior, and then persuaded Bella to buy this house so that he could search for the rubies that he never located. Um, in other words, he may never have managed to locate the rubies that um, motivated this murder, and Detective Ruff suspects this and confides in Bella. And he asks her, might he still in fact be looking for these jewels on the top floor of their home, this attic, which is shut up and off limits to Bella and even to the servants. And Bella realizes, or rather um, rediscovers the truth that she has in fact tacitly known all along that this is, um, uh, that he is brooding about up there at night. So this is how Mr. Manningham is exposed um, and I'll just read this little exchange. So Bella Manningham says, it all sounds so incredible, but when I'm alone at night, I get the idea that somebody's walking about up there. Up there at night when my husband's out, I hear noises from my bedroom, but I'm too afraid to go up. Detective Ruff asks, have you told your husband about this? Bella says, no, I'm afraid to. He gets angry. He says, I imagine things which don't exist. Detective Ruff asks, it never struck you, did it, that it might be your own husband walking about up there? Bella Manningham said, yes, that is what I thought, but I thought I must be mad. Tell me how you know. Detective Ruff asks, why not tell me first how you knew Mrs. Manningham? It's true then, it's true. I knew it, I knew it, says Bella. So Bella Manningham did indeed know deep down that her husband was creeping about upstairs. For as she goes on to explain, 10 minutes after he left the house every evening, the gas light would ebb. And 10 minutes before he came back, it would return to its former full flame. That meant another light must have been turned on, then off again somewhere in the house because the glow of each light would diminish as another lamp siphoned guest pressure away from it. So, Bella Manningham, despite knowing this, was forced to deny and could barely admit to herself what she knew. Her husband's epistemic domination over her was so total that she didn't dare to question his movements, let alone his motives. Indeed, she was the one who felt guilty for entertaining even the slightest doubts about her scurrilous lying husband. From the very beginning of the play, exchanges like the following one show how little latitude she has to question either the rightness of his beliefs or the benevolence of his actions. In Act One, she ventures hopefully, oh, Jack, dear, you've been so much kinder lately. Is it possible you're beginning to see my point of view? Mr. Manningham responds, I don't know that I ever differed from it, did I, Bella? Oh, Jack, dear, it's true, it's true. And here we get again those repetition of the words, it's true, it's true. But here, of course, they ring so hollow because much as Abramson's characterization of gaslighting has suggested, Mr. Manningham has quashed Bella's perspective, her point of view. She's not allowed to so much as acknowledge their divergence in points of view. It is gaslighting about the gaslighting in effect due to her lacking moral standing in the relationship. Okay, so here are some preliminary suggestive lessons that we can take from this case. Gaslighting can thus have a distinctively moral as well as rational dimension. 
via a variety of techniques of which more shortly, the victim may be effectively morally prohibited within the context of the relationship from disputing the gaslighter's epistemic authority and with it, his version of reality, his narrative or his side of the story, which he gets to dictate and that overrides her own sense of that reality. She would be in effect committing a grievous sin again within the ethos of this relationship by questioning, challenging, or disagreeing with him regarding certain matters, which might be more or less extensive or alternatively domain specific. Um, and this again recalls Abramson's characterization of gaslighting, where to quote Abramson, what makes the difference between the fellow who merely ignores or dismisses evidence and the one who gaslights is the inability to tolerate even the possibility of challenge. But uh, as I have noted, I think subtler techniques rather than destroying someone's perspective outright can be used to undermine someone's ability in practice to mount these kind of challenges to the gaslighter's perspective. Um, and certainly uh, one needn't literally drive her insane or even try to do this in order to gaslight. Okay, um, so I want to turn now to a real life case of gaslighting to start to make uh, further points about the possibility of what I've called moral gaslighting. Um, and another advantage of this case is that it's a real life one, it's not fictional, and it's scarcely less extreme than the foregoing fictional case. In some ways it's more extreme. Um, so on the hit podcast, Dirty John, Deborah Newell, a woman in her late 50s, falls in love with and marries a con artist named John. And again, I hope you won't mind indulging me as I lay out the details here. Um, the details, as we'll see, do matter. So John pretended to be an anesthesiologist dressing up in scrubs on their dates, while in reality, John was a nurse anesthetist who had been fired and suspended for stealing drugs intended for patients, some of whom were on the operating table at the time and thus would have been left in agony. He had a long history of um, addiction to prescription pain medication and had stalked and blackmailed many women. He had boasted of raping one of them, at least one of them. He had been repeatedly arrested, served with restraining orders, and when he met Deborah, unbeknownst to her, he had just gotten out of prison for felony drug theft. Just the most devious, dangerous, deceptive person was how one hardened career cop described John Meehan, hence his eponymous moniker, Dirty John. Uh, some people also called him filthy. So, so far we haven't talked about gaslighting here, we've just talked about common or garden lying, which is a distinction I'll go on to make uh, when I move my definition of gaslighting. So, Deborah's children had strong suspicions and worried about their mother. Um, eventually, Deborah found incontrovertible evidence of John's myriad deceptions. She found arrest warrants, restraining orders, jail and prison records, all of which was news to her, um, of, which revealed John's lies, and she moved out of their shared home in Newport Beach. Meanwhile, John was in hospital following a back surgery and ensuing complications of bowel obstruction. When Deborah withdrew from him, he began to threaten her and depicted her as the wrongdoer, accusing her of stealing from him, hitting him, um, and on no basis whatsoever. This was a go-to move for John, painting himself as a victim, again, on no basis whatsoever. Um, and Deborah began to hide out from John in hotels on the advice of a detective whose help she had appealed to. So here's where the gaslighting comes in for the first time, given all of this backstory. Because somehow, nonetheless, in spite of all of this, Deborah not only forgave John, she was persuaded by him that it was all a big misunderstanding. She bought his demonstrable dangerous lies, even after having discovered incontrovertible proof of his various fabrications. So here is LA Times journalist Christopher Gofford interviewing Deborah and shedding light on how he pulled off this uh, feat. So Deborah testifies that 23 day goes by, days go by while he's in hospital and I just want to look him straight in the face and ask him why he did this. 
why all these lies, deceptions, and so on. So I went in there and he said those stories are wrong, that he was set up. He was trying to tell me so many times that he was set up and had to go to jail. Please forgive him. He just knew that I wouldn't understand until he had all the evidence in front of him. All a big misunderstanding, asked Christopher, the journalist. All a big misunderstanding, and he had an answer for everything. And it was so convincing that I thought, okay, he literally had convinced me at this point that he is not this person. Despite all of the paperwork, asked Christopher, yes. And all the facts are right there in front of me, and he is that convincing that I would say that. She trails off. I was also in love with him. It's so hard when you're in love to listen. You're listening to your heart, not your head. So that's part of how he managed this. Um, Christopher went on to ask, did you ask him about his nickname, Dirty John? Deborah, he said it wasn't true. He said, I don't know where you got that from. It was as if everything, she trails off again. He was able to convince me he was so good at it. It could be a cold day out and he could convince me it's 95 degrees. That's how good he was. To where you questioned yourself. It's almost like he convinced you that all the facts about his life were some kind of hallucination on your part. Yes, he made me out to be the one. That's kind of a crucial giveaway line. Uh, that he was this great guy and that everyone else had done him wrong is what he said. He always, again, he always had a story. He told me that he had lied because he thought he'd lose me, that he feels so lucky that I'm such a forgiving person who, hell, I'm the love of his life, that I've made him a better person. Just all this kind of stuff. I felt guilty to some degree that I'd married him and that he's in the hospital, but at the same time I feared. Explain that to me, says Christopher. Guilty, why? Um, and the response was from Deborah, because I made a commitment. I made a commitment to marriage for better, for worse. So what emerges in this case, which was commonly called gaslighting um, in the media, uh, social media, many, many articles, was um, notice that John has here, in effect, a moral carrot and a moral stick, which allows him to manipulate Deborah's beliefs. The moral carrot is something like this. If you believe my story, no matter how demonstrably false it is, I will hold you up to be this wonderful paragon of virtue, a wonderful wife, a loving partner, an incredibly forgiving and sympathetic person who deserves to be valorized, lionized, and who is put on a pedestal. However, if you don't buy my fabrications, I will hold you up to be cruelly unforgiving and shamefully disloyal, etc. So these are moral ways of manipulating someone into buying the kind of narrative that John wants her to buy, um, even if perhaps deep down she never ultimately believes it whole cloth, she nonetheless bought his line, his narrative regarding his life um, for a long time. So notice that importantly, John never alleged that Deborah was crazy. He made her out to be a bad person when she challenged or withdrew for him and a good person for believing him. His epistemic bait for swallowing his story was moral and effective, uh, effective with an A as well as, uh, as luck would have it, an E. Um, it was the prospect of being depicted as bad or mean, not mad or stupid, that made Deborah unable to continue to think ill of John. And that is what allowed him to gaslight her so effectively. Okay, so I want to suggest now that these moral techniques of gaslighting are actually rather common, drawing on this sociological slash psychological research by Paige Sweet. So Paige Sweet has done one of the few um, pieces of extensive qualitative research on the nature of gaslighting uh, which is therefore very useful for my purposes. There's not a whole lot of uh, studies of this kind, and this is a fairly recent 2019 study. Um, hopefully more empirical work along these lines will be done by Sweet and others. So what Paige Sweet found was that crazy bitch was the classic refrain, the literal discourse of the gaslighter in her study, which she conducted with 43 female DV survivors who she recruited through domestic violence shelters. Uh, all but one of them had male abusers, 
And interestingly, Sweet was originally trying to contrast abuse survivors who had, or victims who had been gaslit from those who had it. But she actually found that all 43 of the participants in her qualitative study had been gaslit. So that's interesting in itself. Um, and what I want to point out is that if we focus on the second epithet, the bitch epithet, we can see that there is this moral dimension to gaslighting very commonly where people are depicted as bad or shameful in a variety of ways in order to gaslight them. Um, so here are some examples from Sweet's study. So these are all pseudonyms, fairly obviously, uh, for obvious reasons. So Simone was accused of adultery and not being a good enough mother. Nevea was also accused of being a bad mother. Carla was accused of being a prostitute, where it was clear in context that was a pejorative uh, uh, term or uh, referent, and that she too would make a bad mother while she was pregnant. Rosa, Mariposa, and Adriana were accused of cheating on their partners. Jaylene was called a hoe and a slut by her boyfriend. Fabiola was called nasty and sick by her partner after sex, leading to her sense she was bad. Margaret was accused of deliberately attracting too much sexual attention. Maria S. was told she was too sexually forward by her husband after he propositioned her. Ruby was said to be a witch, and it, it was said that she was trapping her husband in the marriage, where in fact the reverse was true. He was trying to keep her in the marriage. And Rosalind and Louisa were portrayed by their abusers as the real aggressor or abuser, which in the case of Rosalind led to Rosalind being arrested, um, despite the fact that she was the victim and target of abuse in this case, uh, which is sadly not uncommon. So what's really interesting to me about these cases is that even though Sweet's official definition of gaslighting didn't necessarily lead her to look for moral instances of gaslighting, she nonetheless uncovered them in the course of looking at ways in which women's sexuality was weaponized against them in order to gaslight them. And I should make it clear that in the examples I've just given, we haven't yet established that these instances count as gaslighting according to what will eventually be my definition. Um, I'm taking Sweet's uh, research uh, expert testimony here as granted that this was gaslighting in these instances and thus that these are moral uh, dimensions or examples of gaslighting um, given that there were independent reasons to think that gaslighting was going on in these cases. Um, so that is some empirical evidence that gaslighting commonly resorts to moral images of people um, in order to do the work of gaslighting them, to make them, um, roughly speaking, believe or at least buy a narrative that is demonstrably false in line with the gaslighter's desires and interests. That's a rough characterization, but I'll refine it uh, before too long. So here are some more lessons that I'll just go through briefly before I move on to collective gaslighting. Um, the upshot is that making someone question their own rationality or think they're positively crazy is only one way to achieve the kind of epistemic domination which gaslighting characteristically aims at. Sometimes the gaslighter may manage to make his victim feel morally compromised and, for example, bad, shameful, depraved, guilty, disloyal, or insufficiently sympathetic in as much as she deviates from his preferred narrative. And this is in a way not so surprising. So one way of glossing the lesson of Miranda Fricker's framework of testimonial injustice is to say that there are moral as well as rational reasons to believe some people's stories. So for example, it would be immoral as well as irrational to discount the word of a woman due to sexist stereotypes. And what gaslighting can take advantage of is both the rational reasons for believing someone and the moral reasons. So imagine, for example, if John had said, in fact, here truly, look, there's this terrible stereotype about convicted felons. I'm a convicted felon 
believe my story because otherwise you'd be doing me an epistemic injustice. Now that's of course a more sophisticated line that he wielded against Deborah, but the overall effect would be the same. He would be invoking a moral reason for belief in order to prevail upon her to buy his story where that is weaponizing a moral reason for belief where in fact none actually applies because um, he was a liar and fabricating these um, both facts about his life and uh, stories about his good character. So plying someone into epistemic submission in these ways by appealing to her moral capacities can have much the same effect as making her doubt her rational capacities. But importantly, it's plausibly much easier to achieve. Now, why is that? Well, very crudely, um, speaking just for myself, and, and you might want to reflect on whether this is true for you too, I don't characteristically doubt my basic sanity or rationality. Um, basic sanity is a relatively low bar. It would be pretty difficult for an agent to make me think I have the wrong beliefs because I'm just out of touch with basic realities about my environment. However, like most people who care about morality and doing the right thing and ethics uh, and all that good stuff, um, I could much more easily be made to feel that I'm insufficiently sympathetic, insufficiently loyal, um, and am morally in the wrong more broadly for not believing someone's story. So making someone believe that they are bad, shameful, depraved, guilty, disloyal, and insufficiently sympathetic, for those of us who are worried about these kinds of vices and are worried about these kinds of moral mistakes, it's relatively easy to appeal to someone's moral capacities in this way and thus manipulate her beliefs, given that these sorts of moral mistakes happen to everyone since uh, epistemic justice is hard to achieve as an individual. It's hard not to err when it comes to moral reasons for belief. Um, we make mistakes in either direction uh, pretty commonly. Okay, so that I think helps show that uh, the moral technique of gaslighting is of more than academic interest. It shows how gaslighting can be a broader and more prevalent phenomenon than we might have hitherto suspected and an easier uh, thing to uh, pull off. Okay, um, I don't wanna, uh, I think we've gotten the basic gist of this, but the, the basic idea here is that the intended result is that if someone questions or opposes the gaslighter, then that will only strengthen the pre-existing case against her, that there's something fundamentally wrong with her, either rationally, for example, she's delusional, um, crazy, paranoid, etc., or morally, she's a heartless bitch, nasty woman, incapable of trust, cruelly unforgiving, and so on. And so the end result being much the same as well, we'll have someone who is um, unable or unwilling to challenge him. So um, gaslighting thus results in a typical interpersonal case of someone who is uh, under a false sense of moral and or rational obligation to espouse his story over her own. Okay, so just briefly a few collective examples of this phenomenon, uh, and then I'll move to move my definition of gaslighting. Okay, so uh, gaslighting has also been identified as a political phenomenon in cases like the gaslighting of Trump vis-a-vis -vis his supporters in particular. So in Gaslit Nation, a podcast by Sarah Kenzior and Andrea Chalupa, um, they hold that Trump was gaslighting America. Uh, similarly, a book by Amanda Carpenter uh, and the article that went viral, Donald Trump is Gaslighting America by Lauren Duca. Um, and I should say that what these uh, various articles, books, and the podcast seem to be picking up on is that Trump's uh, lies and propaganda was far more systematic than is the case even for the average uh, none too honest, uh, let's say, uh, politician. So there was something particularly systematic and long range about his gaslighting efforts, and they came via a variety of channels and media. Uh, 
Um, a uh, related example uh, that I owe to Elena Ruiz is that of cultural gaslighting, where there are a lot of moving parts to her definition, but she holds that the, uh, the basic idea is simple enough. She holds that the social and historical infrastructural support mechanisms that disproportionately produce abusive mental ambience in settler colonial cultures in order to fend further the ends of cultural genocide and dispossession. Um, that's what cultural gaslighting is. For example, the systemic patterns of mental abuse against women of color and indigenous women in North America that distribute, reproduce and automate social inequalities in favor of white settler populations. And finally, a similar definition of racial gaslighting by the political scientists Angelique Davis and Rose Ernst, they define racial gaslighting as the political, social, economic and cultural process that perpetuates and normalizes a white supremacist reality through pathologizing those who resist. And to cut a long story short, I think that these collective examples of gaslighting should be taken seriously and accommodated in the eventual definition of gaslighting that we come up with. Um, so it won't surprise you that that's what I'm going to try to do in what follows. Um, okay, uh, and another thing I should add about this definition is that it's an attempt to distinguish gaslighting from mere denial, disagreement and manipulation. Um, so it's an attempt to give a, a more substantive characterization of gaslighting that um, gets at what gaslighting is distinctively and doesn't count uh, mere disagreement, denial or manipulation as a case in point. That would be far too broad a definition. Okay, so here is my proposed working question mark definition of gaslighting. Uh, be very curious to hear what uh, you all have to say about this. Um, but here it is. Uh, I hold that gaslighting is a systematic process which functions to make the target interlocutor or audience illicitly feel defective, either morally or rationally, for epistemic deviance, that is from departing for a prescribed narrative and or adhering to a proscribed narrative for her slash them. And in the last couple of minutes here that I have, I'm just going to try to bring out a few features of this definition, and we can obviously talk more about its intended features and perhaps bugs in the Q&A. So here are some points to note about this definition. Uh, I want to be clear here that this makes gaslighting not a success term. You can gaslight someone without that having the effect of making her illicitly feel defective. Um, this is not meant to be something that has to quote unquote succeed in order to count as an instance of that kind. Um, importantly here, illicitly is meant to rule out cases where the target in fact ought to be convinced by an epistemic authority figure of the defectiveness of some epistemic stance of hers and possibly her own defectiveness for buying some kind of false or unjustified narrative. Um, so there are lots of questions to be asked about what this illicitly amounts to exactly, but for my purposes, I want to leave it fairly open to interpretation by different first order normative theorists. Um, because the question of when exactly it is licit versus illicit to try to persuade someone of the defectiveness of some narrative that they have uh, bought into and invested in, I think that is very much up for grabs. Um, so that's in a way a problem for everyone within first order normative ethics. But uh, this is not just an empty part of the definition. It says that, for example, an attempt to persuade someone that she is uh, being paranoid, where that is in fact accurate, that she is being paranoid, that wouldn't count as gaslighting according to this definition. Um, this definition is meant to accommodate not only um, unintentional interpersonal, but also purely structural cases. Um, so when it comes to uh, the collective examples of gaslighting that I, I gave earlier, it's meant to be able to accommodate those because it doesn't require an agent and it doesn't require a particular individual victim. It can be a process that works via a culture or a collective on a broader audience. 
And it also, I hold, can accommodate subtler interpersonal cases of a non-Machiavellian kind. And I'll just give one very quick uh, example of this sort. So imagine that a, an agent has a history of drug abuse and is deeply ashamed of that and is trying to hide it from his partner, for example. And so whenever uh, there, and suppose too that he has relapsed uh, and is now using drugs again um, after um, allegedly um, and ostensibly uh, uh, becoming sober. So his shame might lead to him um, saying things to his partner like, don't you trust me? And you're undermining my progress. And of course I'm not uh, you know, succumbing to my addiction. Things like that would count on this definition as gaslighting, even though the intent isn't to manipulate someone and it's not a Machiavellian case. It's a case where someone's shame and secrecy causes them to gaslight um, not out of an original intent to manipulate, but rather out of a desire to not be perceived as having relapsed. So that's an example of this non-Machiavellian kind. Um, a couple of other points just to finish up. Uh, this is compatible with the intriguing and important possibility of self-gaslighting that I think is important to consider and that I'd welcome questions on. Um, and... Another point to note is that I hold that gaslighting needn't aim uh, contra Abramson to change minds as opposed to mouths. So some gaslighters will not, in fact, really care if the victim or target of gaslighting deep down believes the implausible line being um, promulgated. What they care about is that the victim or target of gaslighting will maintain, if you like, the party line, the official prescribed narrative um, or uh, will give up the proscribed forbidden narrative that they would otherwise um, espouse. Um, and similarly, the gaslighter needn't be convinced of the defectiveness of the target nor their, the correctness of their preferred narrative. Um, a final point to note here uh, before I finish up is that this theorizes the victims of a quote unquote successful gaslighting, that is one that goes through, to use this philosopher's term of art of success here, um, it theorizes the victims of a gaslighting attempt that works as having at least a compromised independent perspective rather than one that is necessarily destroyed outright. Um, and this is important because what I think uh, the mistake that Abramson makes is thinking that the gaslighter needs and insists upon a guarantee that the victim or target can't challenge his perspective. I think he can just as easily rely in some instances on, if you like, a rigged game where this has the appearance of a disagreement, but in fact, the decks are heavily stacked against her, the target of gaslighting, winning the argument. Um, he has, in effect, quashed her ability to challenge him in a robust way by making her illicitly feel defective for so doing. Um, and this helps to explain a point that uh, we can talk more about in the Q&A, the way that disagreement far from necessarily constituting gaslighting may in fact be its natural antidote. Uh, so I'll finish there. Um, thank you all so much.